travelling very fast and I'm heading towards Liverpool. And the reason for that is a video game called Wipeout. So I'm sitting in the sunshine here at Wigan Northwestern waiting on my train to Liverpool. And the reason I'm going back, as I said before, is Wipeout. Uh, because once upon a time I was on the Wipeout game team at Studio Liverpool. And I was sort of the keeper of the vision, I did some web stuff as well, but I was I wrote the backstory in the universe for Wipeout and uh, supplied sort of the graphic designers and the concept artists with uh, future history, I guess, on the and the teams and the, the companies and fictitious entities within the Wipeout universe to inspire them to kind of go on and create the cool stuff that was actually in the game. And it was rewarding, it was a great job to have and I, I was disappointed to leave it so which is uh, why Liverpool always holds a kind of fond spot in my heart, you know, I'm really, really always happy to go back there and Sony contacted me to be part of this uh, retrospective thing they're recording uh, tomorrow. So I was delighted to go back, looking forward to reminiscing about my time on the game and my time in running the Wipeout community uh, with Wipeout Zone, which is the fan site that I started in 2001. As is the way with hotels, somebody set off a fire alarm during the night. Not the best sleep ever. And you too low. So we're not actually recording until um, until much later, until uh, I think I'm 12.30 is my spot. Charlie's in the afternoon. But we're going to turn up early and see how it's all set up and that kind of thing. Hopefully catch up with a few people. Uh, Tuesday morning in Liverpool and we've just had breakfast and uh, I'm here with Charlie, this is Charlie. I've known Charlie in real life for about 12 years and was he really that long? In internet terms Jeez. for I guess we better start communicating towards the end. 2002. 2002. Must have been 2002. Early 2002. I was like the community manager for uh, the official Wipeout Fusion Forums and Charlie was one of the sort of participants on that. Mm -hmm. And then as a kind of the official Wipeout Fusion Forums lost steam. Uh, people started moving to my site, which was Wipeout Zone. And sometime later, fast forward a few years, once we met in real life and met in the Yale festivals, we um, became close enough and friendly enough that I had over running on the site to, to Charlie. So Charlie which admittedly has actually been quite enjoyable. It's been nice um, having a little bit of usefulness on the community side of things as well but um, but no it was uh, it was quite a weird transition really because uh, well I say when I first met you it was sort of like this you just suddenly contacted me saying oh, I'm down in London going to see my cousins again for a barbecue do you fancy joining up and it was sort of okay fine absolutely so it wasn't just you that I met it was pretty much you and your cousin and most of the people that you tend to hang around with it was all sort of like all came at once really so it's, and, it's one of these things I've always mm. been quite inclusive of people. And, yeah. and it's interesting it's like that in the actual Wipeout, Wipeout Zone community as well. Like when we had a convention type thing in Amsterdam in uh, 2007, mm. it was just amazing to put like faces to names, you know, or mm. online IDs. And you're calling people by their, <laughs> <laughs> by their online IDs. There was a guy called Mark whose username was Thruster and he didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, apologies to Mark if you're watching this, but yeah, it was one of those things where you'd be calling him by his uh, username in an Amsterdam hotel. It would have been somewhat dodgy. So, um, but there's a bunch of other guys, and, and I think the friendships in real life helped uh, perpetuate the community. But it, what was interesting, I found, was like, I mean, Charlie's actually better at the game than me by quite some distance. Um, so it's good that the community had someone who was actually good at the game who <laughs> could tell them what to do. Charlie, being a teacher, was uh, done a lot of tutorials and, and how tos, and he wrote a lot of content for the website. Yeah, I think that was kind of where I sort of really picked up. Because me, I'm game, Rob Settles. I'm good at the game. 
yes, okay, admitted I'm better than him, but there are so many people on that site that are way, way better than me, far better than me. I consider, I consider myself good, maybe very good, not brilliant, not brilliant. There are people on there that slaughtering hmm? Yeah, that was basically a couple of years of my life constantly. I had no social life when I was doing that, you did realise. It was just one track over and over and over again. But I think that was where the introduction of the online leaderboards really sort of gave me a little bit of enthusiasm on that one. Because what I'll say, when we first started up Wipeout Future, I mean, bear in mind that was the, the first time there was any real online competition. This was before I found the tables that people up in Wipeout Zone. And, you know, I got to the end of a time trial, got to the end of a round of zone mode, I've seen this code coming up down the bottom, I'm thinking, well, what's all that about? And then I found out about these online boards, and of course, you know, I got a really good run on zone mode, Florian High won, and I thought, all right, just out of curiosity, I'll, I'll put it up and I'll see where I come. And somehow, I mean, I was looking at it, I was thinking, hang on a minute, that's, what, tenth in the country, you know, surely, no, that's, that's not good, and then of course I started thinking to myself, well, okay, how far can I really push this, can I just start doing it again, and again, and again, and again, and I just started working my way up these leaderboards, and of course then I find the, the forums as well, I find the people on there that are above me, and all of this, and it just turns into a nice little bit of friendly competition, and... It suddenly, you know, it, it, it became sort of like who was the first person to break the score, or who was the first person to make the score thing reset twice, who was the first person to break to break zone 100. And of course, every time someone set one of those milestones, I was sitting there thinking, oh, come on, I've got, I've got to do this, I've got to beat this. So it just kept going on and on and on and on. So I think by that time we were, uh, I was actually working at Sony at this point, and uh, so I started at Sony in January 2002. And so we were paying attention internally to the, to the times getting faster, and then when Charlie mentioned uh, breaking the score. Um, the lead programmer on Wipeout Fusion had used, I think, an unsigned integer or something for the score, and it was like a proper telephone number score. I mean, the score was ridiculously high. It was, right? I think, it was 42 million or something. Like that. It was a specific, yeah. As you were going along, but uh, Dave Burrows, the lead programmer, he never thought that anyone would be able to get that high because it was almost uncontrollable after zone 40 or something. So getting faster and faster every lap, we just saw, oh, that an inside injury will do, it's not going to, no one's going to roll it over. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away, it was, it was me and several others, we were just thinking, right, well, yeah. if, if we're going to do this properly, let's just break this thing entirely. So when, and, when we started yeah. talking, there was you and there was a guy, uh, was Brett, was guy. Yeah, yeah, Brett, yeah, I'll, I'll go up his name, I'll yeah, 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 so yeah. Brett. So, then they started discussing the game in terms of uh, reset, like how many times you can make the score reset itself. And it was just like, this was phenomenal. You're thinking, this is not even a competition about what zone you can get to anymore. <laughs> See how many times can we break the score up? <laughs> it was amazing the game actually, because usually you get a, you know, a memory a allocation error in that kind of case. It was actually amazing the game stopped. Yeah. I think the weird thing was, I think the reason why it started to get that high is because we, we found that beyond zone 60, the, the speed actually didn't increase. But the handling of the craft actually kept adapting itself, because obviously as you got faster and faster, the craft handling got more sensitive, so you could actually do stuff with it. So what was happening as you went from zone 70, zone 80, zone 90, was it was still as fast as it always was, but the handling started to get more and more and more sensitive. So weirdly, you started to get into a little bit of a sweet spot around zone 70, zone 80, where it suddenly started to become easier. I think, I think I, the fastest I got to was about zone 38. <laughs> <laughs> and my nose was bleeding in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, at this point in time, so I, I never got to experience yeah. this movie hate. But I think there were, there were sort of like, there were two milestones really, because we had that competition eventually. This was how I found out about Wipeout Zone, by the way, was there was this competition that was set up between the official fusion forums and Wipeout Zone. Um, um, to do with it wasn't actually to do with score it was literally just to do with how high how high a zone you could actually reach and so I was representing the official fusion forums and you know I did pretty well for myself I think it was zone 108 I think I got to it was, uh, it was pretty pretty modest a few people from Wipeout Zone got higher than that Wipeout Zone won at the end of the day um, but again that was how I ended up finding the site and you know from that I saw just there was just a few people that were sort of beating me on this and I just thought right okay I'm going to sit down and I'm going to have a really really good session I'm going to see right how high can I actually push this thing and just for the brief briefest of moments, the very, very briefest of moments, I managed to hit zone 130 on Florian Height 1, which for two weeks, two weeks was a world record. Um, I had lost count of how many times the score resets, and I had Brett telling me it must have been five times, so I'm glad someone was paying attention, because I'm sure it wasn't. Um, wasn't and then video as well at one point? He did a video, because he then beat me two weeks later with zone 151. 
which was never ever beaten. But by, by then I was gone. I was burnt out. I was thinking, no, I, I tried, but I thought, no, I am never in a million years beaten. Now that, that's the end of me. That's, that's the end of me. Um, and that video, it was it was done on a VHS, but the it was actually uploaded to YouTube, and there is evidence that he did actually do it, and it was actually possible to do it. And you can see just how fast it was. I mean, it was literally twitch reflexes. Um, it was it was getting to the stage when I was doing you know, hitting zone 100, 110, where one small distraction and that was it that was the end of your run I mean you were pinballing like you'd, you'd make one mistake all exactly time, yeah exactly I mean you were lucky if it was just one tiny tiny little scrape so you're thinking okay yeah one shield point fine that's okay but then you hit one wall then you hit the other then you hit the other and you just think right if I hadn't done that how much further could I possibly got we will link to this or put some yeah, yeah, I think the, the, the video is pretty easy to find, but um, but yeah, we'll certainly stick something up on that. But it was just a case of, you know, when you start hitting that, it was, you know, you've got your controller in one hand, it's resting on your leg, and you're literally just staring at the telly like this, just, you know, your eyes glazed open, you know, it's just a case of just, just don't blink, please, for the love of God, don't blink. And it was, it was just amazing, it was amazing that I, I never thought I could do that. I genuinely never thought I could do that. When I saw people that were starting to do it, I was thinking, no, that's never going to happen, but... Ultimately, I think, you know, that's just, that's just talking about fusion. It applies to any of the out games. It's all about practice and getting used to the handling. It really is. The more you do it, the more you get used to it, and it just feels second nature in the end. And that's with any of the games. It really is. I mean, you see some of the best players in some of the earlier games finding the shortcuts and all of this. I mean, you know, I mean, take Arnold, for example. You put a Negicon in his hand, and he will absolutely destroy 2097. Yeah. Again, plenty of videos showing how that actually works. Further down the line, when the barrel roll mechanics started coming, you started seeing people trying to pull barrel rolls off where you'd never honestly thought it was possible. It was just people find the more people actually play the game, the more they find out about some of the nuances behind the mechanics and all this. It just it's that's one of the things I've always found really interesting about it. I mean, I've, I've never been one to sort of go out and think, okay, you know, look at it from a very objective point of view, sort of like, okay, how could I shave off a hundred of the second over here? I just, I just play for enjoyment at the end of the day. But it's it's something to see someone who's really nailed the mechanics of the game just go out there and just completely, just absolutely just break it, really. Yeah, I just, remember seeing um, yeah, our friend uh, Arno uh, playing uh, we were in uh, Amsterdam, it was maybe the second uh, convention that we had in Amsterdam, mm. and everyone, we were up in the bar and it got so late that the, the management people said, um, or was it rather was hotel, it was uh, this, this horrendous uh, Hans Brinker budget hotel, we were all, uh, hostel we were staying, you can't even call it a hotel, and so they basically said, well, you can't stay upstairs anymore, but you can go downstairs to the uh, this sort of club thing they had on, underneath. So we all went in and there was shelves and stuff. Then you could park yourself around and we all got our PSPs. Everyone's playing and Arnold was just fantastic at the game. Uh, him and uh, um, sorry, I think of real name not I'm trying, name. I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of other people that were there. Um, yeah, there was, there was a whole bunch of us, but Arnold, yes, it was, one of, this Arnold was one of the best in the world and uh, really so, but the competition was really fierce because when you're there in the moment it wasn't out, was it? Yeah, because Al Sartwell was, yeah. obviously wasn't there, but Al was, uh, Al, Al and Arnold were the two guys to beat mm -hmm. uh, on regular tracks. Um, obviously Brett and Charlie were the zone mode kings, but uh, on most of the other tracks it was Arnold and um, Al who were just, just the best. So anyways, uh, Arnold is like up on a prop top kind of thing, and then at one point he fell asleep and was still playing it, like his fingers were still trying, you still hit the air <laughs> And you could see his fingers moving. In the, I mean, the game had obviously crashed like, before, but I was like dozing away and still playing the game. And, and you could see the muscle memory was just kicking in. He was just basically, you know, metronomic, going through a lap of whatever track. And it was, oh my god, you know, he's finally, he's finally crashed and he's, he's yeah, Arnold, Arnold the Android has finally fallen asleep. And, uh, and it was great. It was amazing to be to see the difference. I mean, I, I kind of switched into a mode of just enjoying the community because uh, everyone was so much better in the game than me. Um, that, that there was no competition there. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to win anything. Um, all the prizes that I brought with me. <laughs> to, to, to get out. So. I mean, I think that says a, says a lot about the whole community thing. Like, mm -hmm. there was a lot of stuff. I, I found it really encouraging how 
people would help other people. If someone found something, found an exploit or something like, was it in Pure where you could side shift on a speed pad and side shifting on a speed pad gave you an extra boost? Yeah. And someone discovered that. It didn't slow you down and it gave you more of a speed boost. And I was like, how the frick are people discovering stuff like this? You know, I thought it was incredible that someone would find an advantage and then immediately share it. Then someone would find it and it would be someone that's maybe tense in the leaderboard would find an, an advantage and share it with Al. Al, try doing it like this. And, and you know, you'd think Al would have thought of everything. Mm -hmm. But then I would report back going, oh yes, you know, you're right, it's, it's actually that does give you a little bit of a speed boost. I'll see what I can do and have a kind of a proper session tonight. And almost that bizarre as well. Like, a proper session was like properly, you know, <laughs> locking the door, <laughs> turning your phone off and, and uh, you know, going for it for a couple of hours mm -hmm. and, or more and trying to get better at the game. Whereas I'd play, you know, an hour at a time, get jaded with it and, and turn off. Maybe I like the dedication to get better. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the incredible thing I found about the community was they'd share the advantage, the competitive advantage would be shared with the rest of the community to better everybody. And yeah. it's just incredible because when you look at all of the competitions for a time were getting won by the same two people. It was either Arnie or Brown. Uh, so what I did was I, I to, to make a competition uh, more elaborate, I said, improvement competition. So I think it was Mega Mall, I think it called it the Madness in the Mall competition, and the track was Mega Mall. And I took a, basically a snapshot of the database um, and saved it, and then said to everybody, here's a competition, and what I want you to do is all improve. So that meant that guys that were absolutely atrocious <laughs> had a chance of competing. And it was really good, it was, it was actually good because guys that normally were like, you know, the futility of trying to beat Arno and Al was, but it also even Arno and Al improved their times, they actually got better as well, and that was incredible. Not by as much of a percentage as the worst guys, but it was really encouraging to see that when you gave someone a sort of, you flipped the, the, the rules a little bit and, and let the sort of less good people try and at least get better at the game. Um, Everyone just mucked in, you know, when he's gone, and that's a cool part of the community. Um, so for years now, I've been at a touch with the community. I've been stepping in a hand over to Charlie, what, 2012? Um, something like that, yeah. It was around, it was just before, I think, it was just before 2048 came out? Something like that, was yeah, it? Yeah, before that, something before, like that. Yeah. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I've been a bit out of touch with the community, but when I step in, you, know, you see. There's old names that crop up, you know, mm -hmm. names, guys that were there in 2001, 2002. Yeah, there's a lot of the old guys that's still there. You still recognise a few names, but the amount of new people was incredible. Considering there hasn't been a new fully fledged Wipeout game for years now, mm -hmm. um, Wipeout 2048 on the Vita was the last sort of new one. Um, but the upcoming Omega collection, I say upcoming, I have to fucking hold this video back until I start it out. Mm -hmm. That's the first kind of big release in Wipeout terms for years now and it's interesting that the community has been sticky. I mean the, the stats on the site and Wipeout's on obviously tail away mm -hmm. in Byron spells. Yeah. I mean we had the gap when Wipeout Fusion came out in 2002. We had this year before Wipeout Pure came out on the PSP and there was basically I think a three year spell where the, the, the community had nothing to do other than mm -hmm. say like what I'd like to see in a new game. You know, yeah. They were basically imagineering their ideal sort of like sequel. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that thread is still going. Every time there's a build up or there's a little bit of a gap between games, there, that thread also it got bumped back to the top. It was like sharing ideas again, thinking about okay, what had been incorporated, what hadn't, what would you like to see in the new game? There were some quite weird and wonderful ideas in there. But that's the thing, I mean, with us, I mean, it's a case of you get one game, but already you're starting to think about okay, how can we change things to actually make the next game better? That's the thing. And of course, you know, when we lost the studio after 2048, that was kind of all we really had left. It was sort of like what was keeping the community going. I mean, we tried to do some community events, tried to do some tournaments and this sort of thing, and it worked. It worked quite nicely. I mean, we had. Um, we had Amy's help for a lot of that as well. She kept uh, kept on as community manager for a little while after the studio after the studio closed, and it was I mean it, it was difficult. I mean knowing that it was unlikely that we was ever going to see another one after this. You know we tried to sort of keep things going, brought some of the old games back in, mainly focused it on Wipeout HD. I mean it was difficult at 2048 given the nature of it, but. Um, it was one of those things where you just felt that you had to keep it going. You had to do what you could to keep it going, no matter what the scope actually was. I mean, the um, the Omnium tournament that um, that we ran, I think I don't know, that was that's got to be about two years ago now. But I mean, it was a long time ago. And it was probably the one off, one of the most ambitious tournaments that we had around. The Wipeout HD Cup was amazing when it actually ran as well. I mean, that was a really, really 
well involved tournament, loads of players get themselves involved in that. I mean, it was possible to actually do, the, do these sort of things at the time. And it just sort of kept a little bit of life going in the games at that point. But of course, you know, as time goes on, you start to move away from, you know, when the last one was released. And you do get that club. People do sort of think, OK, I'm going to take a back seat now. And it was looking a little bit, it was looking a little bit bleak at times when you started yeah. seeing. It was just some of the old guys still posting every so often, but the, the post rate went down. There wasn't as much interaction anymore. Of course, then I the collection was announced and straight away it's bumped straight yeah, back up again, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But some of the old guys come funny back. Because before, like I remember in the sort of like the bleak mm. period of uh, you know, from, from Wipeout Fusion to Wipeout Pure and there was you would get you get people <laughs> I think I was sarcastic to a couple of people because you get some someone coming on the site every now and again who would say, I'm making a wipeout game. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think uh, you know, at one point I had a post that said, you know, if you're new to the forums, here to tell everyone you're making a wipeout game. This is the place to do it, kind of, this is the place to introduce yourself, sort of thing. And I was being slightly facetious, but it was because it kind of went in there. Mm. It was cyclical, you know, you get people that would come on and say, make a web game, and then they'd either be sticky and then stay part of the community, and, um, or they would go away, they would, they would basically say, oh yeah. And it, it, you can't fault them, there'd be some sort of computing student or whatever who had ideas well above his stations, not realising this sort of team of people it takes to build a game like Wipeout. Uh, wasn't there's two projects, isn't there? There is, yeah. I mean, there was one that was was born literally of a thread that was exactly what it was basically just called Let's Make a Wipeout Game, this time for real. And that sort of ended up snowballing to something that actually worked. I mean, again, it was just sort of originally supposed to be a collection of ideas just to see if anyone was interested. And then all of a sudden, there it was. There was an alpha of this this game that was actually really good. This was Slipstream GX. Um, and it was, like I say, it carried on for quite quite a long time. I mean, unfortunately, it's sort of like gone on hiatus now. There's a few issues with carrying it on. I mean, obviously, people going off and having to do other things and all this. Yeah. But um, that's the thing, I think, the, when you're, uh, even when you're an internal studio, mm -hmm. it's all fully funded, you know, you don't have to worry about where the cash is coming from. Even internally at Sony, there can be delays, you know, there can be reasons, uh, resources get moved about, and you don't, you don't get a clear run at it. Um, but even then, it's going to take uh, a good sort of year and a half or more to turn around the game like Wipeout Pulse, which was a sequel to Wipeout Pure, but we want to make it a really good sequel. And it still takes a good run in it. And this is with a, you know, a good team of people, a code base that's already there. It still takes a couple of years to produce this thing. So to do something to the calibre of Wipeout on a, an indie kind of mm -hmm. basis with volunteers and yeah, it was a distributed workforce, essentially, you guys all have all contributed. It's taken years, you know, when people come and go, life gets in the way, people have kids, people, you know, yeah. people's interests sort of wax and wane kind of thing and it's are you actually impressed that the project like such a year? The fact that yeah, the fact that it got as far as it did was was amazing. Like I said, it was doing it part time. It was a hobby. I don't think any of them had sort of another man any experience of actual proper game design. It was just people pooling a load of resources, pooling a load of skill sets, and thinking, let's make this happen. It was done on a purely part time basis and designed in Unity, and it did. It was a, it was incredible. The cheap I've, I've never actually yeah. tried to play it. But yeah, uh, someone sent me an invite code mm -hmm. for at one point, but. Yeah. It was on a PC, I think, and I, didn't, mm -hmm. I don't even know what they have a PC keyboard yeah. running it, so mm -hmm. yeah, I never had a chance. But to it was, I mean, to, to see it get as far as it did was amazing. I mean, may, maybe it will kick off again further down the line, we don't know. But I mean, the, the latest one that's up at the moment is Ballistic NG, which was, again, born out of the same sort of principle. Someone wanting to actually make their own version of what a Wipeout game should be. Um, I think aimed somewhere slightly different. Like what, was, what, Slipstream, what Slipstream GX actually did was they aimed to emulate the later Wipeout games. So incorporating mechanics like barrel rolls, incorporating similar handling systems, um, similar weapon systems, that sort of thing. What Ballistic NG tries to do is emulate the older ones, so the original 2097, Wipeout 3, um, and again it kind of snowballed into something of its own. I mean the original release of it had that kind of handling, that kind of system. Um, it has now evolved where I believe there is also a mode in there where you can actually change the mechanics so that it emulates the later Wipeout games as well. So if that's what you prefer, that's the way you can actually play it. Um, and there's a load of customization options that have been put into it as well, but again it's been designed designed, you know, purely as a, as a, as a backroom project, as by someone who just wants to make this thing happen. I mean, it's even at the moment, it, it's even on Steam. It's a free release on Steam. It got through green lights, and it's it's got a fantastic audience. Again, it really has. Provide a link to that as well mm. in the description. Yeah, but it's, it was, it's an amazing right. achievement. And like I say, on the back of... Um, Obviously, seeing the studio shut down, I mean, you know, people didn't just want to see this kind of genre of game disappear. They wanted to carry on, even if it wasn't another wipeout. And of course, seeing the community being able to 
or startup projects like Strip Burn, Slipstream GX, starting up projects like Ballistic NG. That was how much that the real hardcore fans of the game actually wanted to see this thing actually carry on and to, to go and do it, to make it happen, was absolutely fantastic at the end of the day. It's a, it's a testament to the strength of the community. Mm. Uh, you know, you look back uh, 20 something years since uh, the original Wipeout came out. Mm -hmm. um, we're today going to be, you know, in the official mm -hmm. uh, Sony retrospective, going to be talking about how influential it was and how inspiring it was for people. And it's, I think, there's nothing more of a testament to that than the actual community that's still going, mm -hmm. you know, all this time later. I mean, it, Wipeout Zone was originally called the Wipeout Pilot Association. It started by a guy called Carlos Altman, who was given up after a year or so and passed it on to me because I, I would set up a site called Wipeout Zone. And so he basically handed the community over to me, and that was sort of tail end of 2000. I launched Wipeout Zone in January 2001, and here we are, 2017, you know, we're, um, we're actually now creeping into the chronology <laughs> in the original Wipeout, you know, events about, uh, you know, the birth of anti gravity creators and things like that. This is actually now we're you know, getting to the point where uh, we're sort of, the, the sort of sci-fi that was written for the original was uh, 20 years ago is now starting to get a bit too close for comfort. That is true. In fact, I believe it, if we go from the original dates in the Wipeout 3 manual, I think it was, um, this year is supposed to be when um, fires are energy systems are formed. There you go. Yeah. Right, we better move on to, to make the original, the original, the official uh, Sony recording thingy. Mm -hmm. and hopefully meet with Nick Burke and, and have a chat now. Sounds good. So we'll catch you later. Take care, fellas. Warning. Right, so we're finished with the official uh, Sony thing uh, here down in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And we're just having a quick beer before we'll have to go for a train this back to... Wherever really, you go up, I'll go down. Whence we came from. Absolutely. And it's been an interesting experience. Uh, I was worried, uh, not worried, concerned uh, slightly that the, the new developers might be taking the game in certain directions that, uh, that long-term fans might not appreciate. But uh, after speaking to the, to the guys involved, I'm actually really, really impressed with what they had to say. And it was keen that they were keen to to pick our brains and, and learn things from us as well, you know, it's quite humbling to be asked uh, back after all these years of involvement to, uh, to talk about the game. Absolutely, and the thing is, and on, the, on the same note as well, I mean, what they also seem to be trying to encourage is I think we're going to see a level of community involvement as well, but I don't think we've seen for a very, very, very long time. I mean, we've been trying to do our own things, obviously, on a community level, sort of like the tournaments and that sort of thing. But from what I'm hearing, I mean, we're going to have far more opportunities to do things like that. But hopefully, we're now going to start to see a little bit of maybe official involvement as well. Um, it sounds like we're going to have some quite exciting times coming up as a result of all of this. So I'm really, really excited to see exactly how this all, it's all going to work. Indeed. So in the uh in a little over four years time it'll be mm -hmm. the, the 20th anniversary of uh, Wipeout Zone coming into existence and it's good to know that uh, with the Omega collection coming out mm -hmm. and the potential of future sequels to Wipeout that the, the communities could have a lot of life in it yet and mm -hmm. uh, that's really good, it's really good to learn that and I think it bodes well for the fans of the game mm -hmm. both long term and creating a new generation of fans that could possibly have something that maybe have been overlooked mm -hmm. uh, to get into. No, I don't think so. I mean, with, even with even with this new game coming in, I mean, it, it is a new platform, but we are looking at it on the PlayStation Network on the PS4. There are going to be new players that are not necessarily going to experience the game before. And really, I mean, all of us, I would imagine, are going to commute basically over to this new version of the game. And really, it's up to us to make sure that we foster the community in the way that we always have done, to encourage the new players to come in, and really just to make it work in a way that it hasn't worked necessarily for years. So it's probably it has worked, but you know what I mean. It's um, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity, and I think all of us really are going to need to grasp this and really ensure that we leave them absolutely no opportunity but to keep on supporting Wipeout because absolutely. it's we've we've missed it for such a long time, and now we've finally got this opportunity to really push it back into the limelight. We're going to need to really make sure that we do that. Yeah, and I think I, I need to check the install base of the PS3 when uh, Wipeout HD was launched. Mm -hmm. but I don't think it was as big as the PS4's install base is mm -hmm. for the Omega Collection. So the fact that the install base is like seventy odd million consoles for the PS4, this is launching during the perfect point in the life cycle of the console um, that it should be able to reach a new audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm no more excited about playing 
the audio collection than it was before. Actually, I'm really interested yeah. to get it. Can't wait uh, mm -hmm. to pick up my copy and uh, burst open the cellophane and, and get it in uh, and begin the June when it when it comes out. Yeah, it's, it's going to feel like getting a physical copy again. <laughs> I had one of those for years. It's going to be great. Right. Okay, um, well, I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to say, and um, cheers for now. Take care, guys.